So we're going to wrap up today with my favorite, favorite regiment of the entire United States Color Troop. Um, and I think the reason why this is my favorite regiment, number one, is because Ike was a part of it. I mean, why would you not love this regiment? But also, um, what the First Kansas does is, through its story that in some ways I feel has been sort of co-opted by popular culture, right? Like Bass Reeves became this big figure once Hollywood and, and media got a hold of, of who he was. The first Kansas has never truly been treated in that same fashion. It's always kind of taken a back seat to the 54th Massachusetts that got this big production and this incredible movie that like made the careers of so many of the actors and people that we know today, right? But once you dig into this story, I can pretty much guarantee you I'm going to have a bunch of other people on the first Kansas you know, fight with me <laughs> that are gonna, you know, I, for me personally, I feel like I have this whole entire regiment standing behind me saying, tell everyone about us. Nobody knows or they're not paying attention. And so be sure as you take away other pieces from other parts of what I've talked about to make sure that you continue talking about them, okay? That's your pinky promise for me. Um, and just so you guys know, this is being recorded. Too. So if you ever want to go back, you're like, she said something about red shoes on a Sunday, then you can go back and rewind it and listen to it. So in order to establish what the first Kansas is, um, and then later their designation as the U.S. Color Troop 79th Regiment, we have to talk about the timeline. Don't you guys notice how I always present this way? You got to know who was where and what and all those details, right? If you read any story in the newspaper or if you read it digitally, you got the who, what, when, where, how, and why in the first paragraph. That's how people are supposed to write now. Of course, journalists now take a little bit more liberal. They're more liberal. That lead goes into like three or four paragraphs sometimes, but you know, it's time change. But let's establish what's going on with, this, with these people, okay? Now, if we're talking about the Civil War. That begins on April 12th, 1861 in Sumter, at Fort Sumter in South Carolina, okay? That's what signals the start of the Civil War. From there, in August of the same year, so four months later, we have the Confiscation Act. And we're going to be talking about a lot of acts and whatnot, but we know who was president during this time. It was Lincoln, right, okay? So the first Confiscation Act, it allowed the federal government to seize property being used in the rebellion. Now, you're probably thinking land. But property included people. It included the enslaved. So the federal government could come and seize. Now, one of the things that's really sort of misunderstood about what happened during the Civil War is these are people who said, we are not part of the United States anymore. We are forming our own country, which means they rescinded their citizenship to the United States. Why do you think these people had to do an oath of amnesty back into the fold of the United States in order for them to be able to vote? Had to go in front, I, yes, I turned down the Confederate States, I'm a US citizen, with all the things, you find oaths of amnesty for Confederates. It's because they were their own country, right? And if the US government said, no, you are not, Okay, no you're not, we're gonna come and seize your property because we can because you were being treasonous, right? This whole confiscation act happened and how could they, how could they, how could it get any traction because a big portion of the country is like, forget you, we're our own nation, right? So then we get to the second confiscation act because we passed one, that didn't do anything. <laughs> we're passing the next one and this one was a little different in that it allowed the federal government to free enslaved people on rebel territory. Now, some of you are like, but didn't that what the Emancipation Proclamation did? Nope. That was a federal order. That wasn't a law. Okay? So, in addition to allowing the federal government to free enslaved people in rebel territory, okay? And you have to think about rebel territory that's Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, right? It also prohibited the return of fugitive slaves. Remember, we had an entire act that said that if I, as an enslaved person, ran away and I went to another area, that if you were a person who could not be enslaved, you had to return me back to where my people were, my enslaver was. Legally, you had to do it or you could be arrested. This said, 
Fugitive Slave Act, mm -mm, bye. Not anymore. People are not going to be prosecuted for that. It allowed for the confiscation of Confederate property through court action. So that's not only just land and enslaved, they could come and take your slaves too through the court, okay? Then it also allowed the Union Army to recruit black men. Do you all realize that this act and another one, the Militia Act, are actually what are the framework of our US military today? And we don't even, like we're like walking around like not even necessarily thinking about it in that way, okay? And as groundbreaking as it was, how in the world are they gonna enforce this? <laughs> like, literally, how are they gonna enforce it? So if we keep moving forward, we get the Militia Act, right? The initial one was in 1792, but they changed it so that black men could be enlisted into the federal troops. And it solidified their pay rate and everything. It also established quotas that states had to fulfill in order for their militias and their state level regiments. And it created the first um, iteration of our selective service. When you become 20 years of age and you have to go down and register, I'm like, why do, why do the boys have to do that and girls don't? I always wondered that, right? That was established as of the Militia Act. Then, that's when we get to the Emancipation Proclamation. You guys saw all that stuff that happened before we get to the Emancipation Proclamation. There were a lot of things that happened. That was as of January of 1863. One of the most misunderstood aspects of that is that it exempted certain counties and states entirely. It said everybody is forever free in rebel territory, right? Except <laughs> in these counties, in Mississippi and Louisiana, and they list out the counties, you all, and in certain states because they were already under federal control. So then what does that mean for the enslaved people who were there? The, the, your person who is in the next state, who is not exempted, is technically free, but you're not because the union troops are in your area? Y'all know we don't ever do everything entirely straight. <laughs> we don't. The, the metaphor I use is that our flag is blue and it's red for a reason. Those are two colors that are polar opposite. One is red and it's warm and one is blue and it's cold and the white bridges the two. So anything we do is going to have contrast like that because that's the foundation that our country has, literally. Then when you add in the contradiction of what freedom was, I consider those of us who descend from enslaved people the thread that holds together the stars and the bars. Because we weren't necessarily considered when all these lofty concepts were being developed. But that's me and my artistic brain trying to make sense of some of this stuff. So then we get the Conscription Act. Of course, you got the Militia Act, Conscription Act. All of that stuff leads the way for us to be able to legally recruit black men and also have black women participate in the Civil War. We're gonna talk about them a little bit later because you're like, what? Yes, did you know Harriet Tubman was a spy? Oh yes, baby, she was a spy. I, she was, see, I like how they did her in the movie, but I don't like how they did her in the movie, but that's my own personal opinion. Either way, we're gonna move forward. In the Cherokee Nation, Cherokee Nation abolished slavery in 1863. Okay, so this is right. He's looking like, wait a minute, they did, right. And slaveholders, they were required to free their enslaved people or be fined after June of 1863. But you have to remember, a lot of folks had already left the Cherokee Nation and went into Kansas. That's where my folks were and some of them just stayed. But then when you get the treaty provisions of 1866, come back, right, in order for you to get your citizenship. What I've noticed, and I would love to talk to anyone else who studies Freedmen, is there's a whole bunch of us that end up in Nawada, Bonita, at the very northern part of the Cherokee Nation. And some of us that stay down here in the southern part, but we are just really jam-packed up there. And is it because those folks went to Kansas and they came back? I don't know. It remains to be seen. Then we finally get the 13th Amendment, okay? That's in January of 1865. That ends slavery except in the instance of punishment for a crime, which means we still have slavery in the United States. 
those four million enslaved people who we had prior to the Civil War, the population of people who were incarcerated today mirrors that same amount of people who were enslaved. It's almost a direct correlation. We replaced our enslaved population with people who were incarcerated. When you start looking at pig law, fence laws and um, pig laws and, and Jim Crow ticky tack things like vagrancies and all that so that people could be arrested and then held in jail and then you could then be leased out as a convict to your former slave owner who can pay you pennies on the dollar for your labor. Come on now. It's the same thing, okay? If you've never seen The 13th on Netflix by Ava DuVernay, it will give you a master class in what I'm talking about, okay? So Congress, they did what they could. They ended slavery. My favorite part about this is that the, it, in order to get the number of states to ratify it, to make it a national law, that didn't take place until December of the same year. <laughs> and I like to think it's because they wanted us to work that last crop. <laughs> right? So if the state don't ratify, it's like, oh, okay, then, all right, we can do it in December. <laughs> then that way we got that last crop out. I don't have proof, but I'm just using my, I'm using my sanctified imagination there. So Robert E. Lee, he surrenders at Appomattox Courthouse. Whoops, let's go back. He surrenders at Appomattox Courthouse in April of 1865, right? Our standard picture, you know, the one where Abe Lincoln is like this, he's like a statue with the tap pad and they have the tent and all that stuff. Uh, I think that was Matthew Brady. I love Matthew Brady's pictures in the Library of Congress. Um, we get the surrender, then, then, Lord, me and this remote, I'm doing the most. All right, whoops, there we go. So we don't get the ratification until December, okay? Then we get the Treaty of 1866 here. This is where, especially as freedmen, our story is unique, right? Because 13th Amendment applies to the United States. That doesn't apply to us. So even though slavery is abolished technically in 1863 in the Cherokee Nation, it isn't really solidified in terms of our citizenship rights until we get to 1866. So we're held in this sort of a legislative limbo. And that's where you start seeing things, like I mentioned, like the chamber's court, where people are going before the court and saying, hey, I'm, I'm formally enslaved. Can you make sure I have my citizenship? OK? I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Then why during the removal were, were the uh, freedmen coming with the, the Cherokee people if they were free at that time? If that's the whole life you knew, right, those are the people that are there. Sometimes they were family members. Mm -hmm. Right? Sometimes it's your family. Sure. I know, for instance, with George Fields, who's my ancestor, he was a part of the forced removal. When you look at his uh, listing on the, um, the 1835 roll, it delineates that he doesn't have enslaved people, but there are mixed Negroes with him. There's a whole, it's two pages in the book. And I remember I had somebody challenge me, like, oh, he didn't have any slaves. And I was like, but you didn't see the mixed Negroes. <laughs> like, you know, like, because it's a long form and it has columns and you see mixed Negroes. They delineate between mixed Negroes and a slave. There's a reason why there's two columns. We could, we could do a whole week's class on that census because people think enslaved people, you know, or even free people of color just didn't live amongst our people. They were there the whole time. I don't even want to say they were hiding. I think it's just we didn't see it based off of how we read things now. You, I love her face. I love when I can see people thinking because that's that tells me it's spilling down. Right, right. So then good old Andrew Johnson, he's very polarizing because Lincoln was sort of more progressive and he came in and made that handshake deal and then the Reconstruction just came tumbling down in the United States. But he doesn't officially declare the end of the Civil War until August of 1866. That's when they say it's over. So that's what gets us to the first Kansas, OK? And that's a lot of history. But there's a whole lot more going on in the state of Kansas. This is why I think that whoever wrote Glory, I think the reason why they didn't choose the first Kansas is because it involves slavery and Native Americans. And that's not easy to communicate. 
right? It's like, but I don't want them thinking about, you know what? Let's go to the 54. That's easier, right? Me, I accept the challenge because this is, this is better. You'll see. You'll see. So we don't get the first Kansas without this man. Look at him looking all mean and, you know, you couldn't smile in pictures back then. The, the, you know, the exposure time was too long. But this is Senator James Henry Lane. He was an abolitionist, okay? And he was in Kansas. And if you know anything about Kansas, <laughs> during the Civil War and before, there's a reason why they called it bleeding Kansas. Them folks got to fighting, okay? They wanted the state to be admitted as a slave state. It was not. So then you had a faction of people who were more aligning to Missouri, which was a slave state. Then you had people who were like, oh, no, we don't want to be a part of that. So folks were literally dying over the issue of slavery in the state of Kansas. And here you got Senator James Henry Lane after we get the Conscription Acts, right, in 1862. And as per the Kansas Historical Society, it says early in August of 1862, Lane notified the Secretary of War Stanton that he expected to recruit four white regiments and two black regiments and said, receiving Negroes under the late act of Congress, is there any objection? Now, he knew he didn't have an internet. He didn't have a cell phone to text this, right? So he knew it was going to take time for them to respond. But he liked good trouble. So he went and assumed that he could just do it. Doesn't that make a more interesting story? Right? But here's the thing. Three weeks later, Stanton responded <laughs> that the president hadn't authorized black troops <laughs> to be in any units, right? They would not be accepted into the Union Army. And that meant that the units would not be equipped or supplied with any normal, through nor any normal army channels. So he got in good trouble, right? Because had he not gotten in good trouble, we wouldn't have the first Kansas, OK? So let's talk about the recruiting. And it's a little hard to see here in person, but this is literally an ad that they placed in the newspaper to recruit black men into the first Kansas. And because so many of our freedmen people were in Kansas, they were seeing this advertisement, OK? Think, think about it. The US and the Cherokee Nation, Indian Territory is in disarray. We are in a war, y'all, OK? So, they began to recruit the first Kansas on August 6, 1862. They attempted to uh, recruit a thousand. Can you imagine? A thousand, right? U.S. color troops ended up with almost 180,000 black men. That's like what? Almost what? Tulsa, I think, is uh, 500,000 people live there. That's like half the population of Tulsa. Okay. And the first enlistments, they had 50 at Leavenworth, this is Kansas, 50 at Fort Scott. Three companies organized in three weeks. Okay, the company has 100 people. Now, think about it. Ten companies were almost full within a month. Where were they getting these enslaved people? Where were they getting these people from? Because, <laughs> right? Slavery is still active. That means that these people are running. There were, even, there were even notations of people from Kansas going into Missouri and kidnapping, basically, enslaved men and bringing them back to Kansas for them to enlist. Right. So what were they promised? Every colored man exists enlisting who may have been claimed as a slave shall receive, in addition to his rations, a certificate of freedom for himself for his wife, his mother, and his children. Anybody with good sense, who is going to turn that down? Because think about it, in the war effort, we're basically sitting there like, they didn't got the fighting. What are we going to do? I don't know. I could go with my slave owner. Yeah, I don't know, but I don't want to work for him anymore. Um, wait a minute, what's the ad? Oh, they going to pay me $10 a month? I'm going to get rations. I'm going to get clothes. I'm going to get shoes. And I can free me, my wife, my kids, and my mama? Bye. Because think about it. What are you left? OK, so what if there's a fight here? I get a straight bullet, a cannonball, whatever it is. You know what I mean? Like, or disease, right? I mean, there's a number of different things that I could potentially have happen to me. 
I could even potentially be sold back into slavery to Texas. Come on now. So again, I, I am clear, especially when you see these, these long ads in the paper, why they did it. So let's talk about the places of origin. When the men enlisted, where were they from? 40% of them were from Missouri. Missouri is a slave state, right? So you have to imagine, of course, some of them are free people of color. Those are individuals who were not enslaved prior to the Civil War, meaning they obtained their freedom by a number of means. They could have been manumitted, which is a private act, right? Your slaveholder uh, writes a will, I free my enslaved person. Emancipation is when a law is issued. That's the difference between manumission and emancipation. Could you say that first one again? Manumission. So a manumission, private act. I have a will, I free my enslaved people, or I go to the courthouse and say, I want to free my enslaved people. I've found manumission in Cherokee tribal records. Whole little smattering of them. I free my enslaved people, right? But emancipation, that's when a law, a law happens and it frees people. So we've got 40% Missouri, 35% Kentucky. That's like 75% of the regiment. And then the other 25% is coming from Alabama, Arkansas, Indian Territory, Mississippi, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Virginia. That's where they were born. Right. So number one question. I'm in here talking cash money trash about the 54th Massachusetts. But was the first Kansas really the first? Absolutely. Why? Because the 54th wasn't recruited until February of 1863. And I just told you the first Kansas was recruited in August of 1862. They didn't have their first battle, the 54th, until July of 1863. Remember the end of the movie? They're running. They're on the field. Our boys had been to battle and more and come back home and got enlisted in the Federal Army. So no, not true, OK? First South Carolina organized mid to late 1862. They were made official in January, but then they were disbanded. So they didn't even hit the field. Then you, maybe let's go to Louisiana. Remember my two legs in Louisiana? Okay. First, second, and third Louisiana Native Guards, also called the Corps d'Afric. Okay. They were organized in the fall of 1862. So maybe, but the first Kansas recruited in August. First battle two months later. Two. Remember when he wrote Stanton and Stanton said, you don't have permission, y'all ain't going to have no equipment. He was literal. You're not going to have anything. But they fought a battle and they won. OK, now they were the fifth black regiment mustered into federal service. And I think that's the reason why people technically say they aren't the first because the 54th went before them. But in terms of enlistment, in terms of recruitment, in terms of having first casualties, it was the first Kansas. So it depends on who you ask, but I think I've converted all of you. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so let's talk about leadership. These men are looking like they are just kicking butt and taking names, aren't they, with these photos. This is Colonel James Monroe White. If you notice, many of the officers are abolitionists and or they are conductors on the Underground Railroad. OK? So James Monroe White, he's an abolitionist. He was a part of the 5th Kansas Cavalry. He recruited for the 1st Kansas uh, in Leavenworth. That was his headquarters. Henry Seaman, he was also from the 5th Kansas. He was an abolitionist, and he recruited the southern part at Mound City. So many of the Cherokee freedmen you will see enlisted, they enlisted at Mound City. So they were coming in through Henry C. Seaman. Now, the uh, officers, again, when we get into federal enlistment, right, when they go from being a state unit, which they operated as from August until December of 1862, we get to January of 1863, that's when they become federal troops and they get the supplies and all the things and all of that stuff. When they get to federal, their officers are all white, okay? And there's a reason why I'm pointing this out. We got Richard Ward. George Martin, again, if you know anything about Freedmen or Cherokee Nation, <laughs> you're wondering, Ward Martin? Might be, don't know. John R. Grattan, Armstrong, Luther Thrasher, Ethan Earle, okay? But did you know that Company D was originally officered by a black man and several black men, and this was before federal muster in. You're looking at a picture of William D. Matthews. He was a prominent free black man a conductor on the Underground Railroad. He was given the ability to recruit 
openly recruit for the first Kansas, and he was made an officer of Company D. All the officers in Company D were black until they mustered into federal service, and then they demoted them all. Now, there were nurses and cooks and maids and laundresses. What do these women do? They came in and they were making the meals for the troops. They were mending uniforms. Remember, we didn't have nothing, y'all. So if we have a tatter in that uniform, you, somebody's going to have to sew that up. Or we're going to have to do your laundry. And there were several women who were Cherokee freedmen who were laundresses for this unit, including Amanda Hall, Dorcas Buffington Riley, Harriet Markham, and Lindy Sanders. And more recently, their actual pay cards have been digitized and uploaded to Ancestry, so you can actually search for them in the regimental hospitals and see them as nurses. So let's talk about the perception of them, OK? And this is from Colonel M.P. Chipman. And this was in Fort Scott, Kansas, October 16th, 1862. So this is right before Island Mound, their first battle. Laying aside the question as to the policy and propriety of making soldiers of the Negro race and viewing them as machines of war. Look at how he's phrasing this. Are we turning them into our literal machine guns for us? Right? But if we put that aside, I must say that the inspection was highly satisfactory. They exhibit a proficiency in the manual and in company evolutions truly surprising and the best company is the one officered by black men. Remember William D. Matthews, right? The white officers are enthusiastic, and they would rather drill and discipline black men than white. I know I have seen very many regiments longer in the service than these, which would appear badly beside them. And again, I told you they didn't have the right stuff, and they were still out here doing the most. So. Let's talk about the adversity they faced. Because in Kansas, when you go through the newspapers, these people were so proud of this regiment, but then there were also people who were like, why are we got black men fighting for us? Like, why are we doing that? OK? They are clothed with a lot of gray clothing, which was on hand at Leavenworth when General Halleck confined the uniform to blue. They weren't even in the right color, y'all. They had the hand-me-down uniforms. Their arms are Austrian and Russian muskets. Not good. OK. More. These men have been recruited with the promise that they were to fight, not to work as common laborers. Because you have to think about it. From this period forward, they were being, you know, before that, they were being trained as, as military men. They were out picking cotton. They were out servicing enslavers, potentially. Or if they were free people of color, maybe they had their own businesses. But they had a specific purpose being in the military. And they were expecting to be treated as soldiers, right? Not as third rate folks, OK? And th they wanted, all they wanted to do was fight for their freedom. That was it. Same quote is from same Colonel M.P. Chipman, October 16th, 1862, OK? So more on the adversity front, OK, is the pay disparity. The Conscription Act and the Militia Act codified that black soldiers were to be paid less than white soldiers. And in addition to the $3 difference in just base pay, they also took money out for your clothes and other stuff. They took an additional $3 out, so the black soldiers only made $7 and the white soldiers made 10 Again, they were largely willing to take this because they weren't being paid before this, right? But it's still not equitable. Now, in terms of casualties, you have five officers and 183 enlisted men, and one officer and 165 enlisted men who died from disease. More often than not in the Civil War, people die from disease rather than from gun warfare. Because you have these big camps of folks. Again, you guys know we would do this right now, right? So that's what happened. All right, so we're going to talk about key events in the timeline of the 1st Kansas, OK, or US Color Troop 79th Regiment once they get into federal service. First, they're enlisted in August of 1862, OK? 
first battle is the Battle of Island Mound. If you live here you know, locally, you guys can actually go to these battlefields because they're commemorative sites and they tell the story of the first Kansas, okay? That happens near Bates County, Missouri, and they attempted to clear out guerrillas at Toothman Farm, which they had settled on, but they renamed it Fort Africa. Now, they were given time off after this. I always thought they just rolled straight into federal service, right, you know, October, really November, December into January. No, when I read through the pension files of several of the veterans, they say they gave us time off, and some people went AWOL, and they had to go and find them. <laughs> so, yes, that did happen. So they get mustered into federal service on January 13th of 1863 as the United States Colored Troops 79th Infantry. Note that it says new because the previous one was in Louisiana. So they had to designate between the other one, that one and the other one. Now, this is, was printed in the Leavenworth Times on November 9th, 1862 to talk about the Battle of Island Mound. We have drilled and worked until we have 600 of the best disciplined and drilled soldiers that excepting the Wisconsin Ninth has ever been seen in this region. All of these things have been public have not been done under, the, under a bushel, and yet we have not been recognized. They're like, give us our props, okay? Because they were even fighting in over the 54th in the first Kansas. Except in the uh, semi-authoritative, negative manner, which I have recorded, our nine days campaign proved that Negroes are splendid soldiers, will march further, fight as well, and live on as hard fare without grumbling as any soldiers now in the service of the government. So more events. We end up, if you like to list, you know, if you like reenactments and you want to hear all the bloodshed and all that stuff, you know, that's not my forte. I like to learn the people stories. That's my personal thing. They were part of the battle, the battle of Cabin Creek. There is a wonderful man on the t-shirt in here named Mr. Stan Waddy, who uh, was a Cherokee general. He's over there in gray. <laughs> he was a part of one of these battles, <laughs> believe it or not. We got the Battle of Honey Springs. We also have the Battle of Poison Spring. These are all commemorative places that you all can drive to that are not that far away from where we're currently living, <coughs> right? So these battles take place between July of 1863 and April of 1864. They end up making maneuvers where they end up stopping at Fort Smith. So if you go to Fort Smith and you go to the fort and you see the commissary building, they were in and out of that place. Um, and they were stationed there for a bit. Um, and then Fort Scott, if you go to Fort Scott, that's also a, a site that's connected to the first Kansas. Now, more events for them. We've got Flat Rock Creek and the second battle of Cabin Creek, which Stan Waddy was successful. I will give him his credit for that. Um, we've got the Battle of Timber Hills, as well as the first Kansas mustering out in Pine Bluff, Arkansas on October 1st of 1865. So just imagine, that's on the opposite side of Arkansas from where we are right now. Now remember, they were fighting in battle, having casualties, um, drilling, doing all that stuff, doing whatever they needed to do until January without the proper resources. I found out when I went to Fort Smith that when they got to Fort Smith and they saw the second Kansas, remember the second Kansas came up after them, they saw them in brand new uniforms. So they went to the, they went to the quartermaster like, why are we still in gray? And he was like, it's cause you guys didn't ask. Okay. <laughs> so now that we've established as much as we can about the US color troops, first or 79th regiment, first Kansas, I'm gonna dip into some profiles of some Cherokee freedmen in particular who were a part of this regiment. Because one of the things I think people think when you hear presentations like this is they don't know how to make the connection to people who are tied more closely to them. And you may or may not see some names of some families that you know. Of course, we're gonna start with my boo. Now, Ike Rogers, he was enslaved by Alzira Price May, who was a Cherokee. We talked about him earlier. U.S. Deputy Marshal under Judge Isaac Parker, rode with Bass Reeves, captured Cherokee Bill in the Indian Outlaw, and of course, murdered by Clarence Goldsby. We went through all of that earlier. He was in Company E, and we've got more documents for him. All right. So that's a little bit closer of his oath of office as a deputy marshal. We've got the information about him being shot at 
200 times <laughs> surviving and then being murdered on the train depot. I just, just the craziest thing ever. And then this is actually a newspaper clipping that someone in my family kept from when he actually died. And that literally survived people leaving Oklahoma and going to Kansas City and made its way out to California. So I don't even know the newspaper this was in, but they clipped it out at the time and they kept it. Alan Lynch, my other favorite, favorite person from this regiment. He was also in Company E. He was born in the Cherokee Nation as well, okay? He was enslaved by John Lynch, who was a Cherokee. He was injured in the Battle of Honey Springs. He was also a part of what was considered like the VFW of the time as a Grand Army of the Republic. He was accused of being a professional witness by the Dawes Commission. They said he was, he was, he was serving as a witness for too many people. And they claimed that everybody he knew was back in the time of the treaty. Being a pensioner, right? He's prominent, he's doing a lot. Um, he was enrolled, right? So his descendants actually can um, apply for citizenship. And he was married to a woman who's actually on the by blood roll for the Cherokee Nation. So documents for Alan Lynch. This is a casualty sheet from his Civil War service file that notes that he has a slight wound on the left side after the Battle of Honey Springs. Additionally, we also have him being noted as serving, uh, having an affidavit in a U.S. court that was for a case around freedmen rights. You know, if the, uh, the thing is, people may have seen these names before, but they didn't make the connection that a lot of these men were serving in the exact same regiment during the Civil War, okay? Then we have the GAR election, Grand Army of the Republic, where he is made Sergeant of the Guard, okay? And then this is an extract from the 1880 Cherokee Census, where there he is with his wife. And another clue, if you've ever used the 1880, which sometimes they would use that as a litmus test for whether people returned back in time for the treaty, one of the things that they did was they actually wrote the Dawes card number on that census. So if you're not sure if it's the right people, you can look here. It says Alan Lynch, A for adopted, colored, okay, F. 700, that's Friedman 700. Notice his wife does not have an F in front of her number. That tells you she's on a by blood card. So if you're not sure, again, if you find the DOS card and you're not sure if you found somebody in 1880, on the 1880 Cherokee census, connect it to the numbers listed and you'll know if it's the same people. All right. So next person, Amos Adair. There's a whole town called Adair, <laughs> right? He was also in Company E. So that meant when we were, on, we were in the line going down, fighting, all of these men were fighting together in the same company that I'm telling you about that are Cherokee freedmen. Amos Adair, he was born in the Cherokee Nation. He was enslaved by Ned Adair and George Washington Adair, who were both Cherokees. He was injured in the Battle of, of uh, Poison Springs in 1864. He participated in a lot and coordinated Civil War veterans reunions. You will find him in the newspaper noted with that. He was a part of the Grand Army of the Republic in Kansas. He was rejected by Dawes, so his descendants cannot apply for citizenship and be approved. And the reason why is because he stayed in Kansas. They didn't come back, okay? Now, he's buried at Leavenworth National Cemetery, and that's actually his headstone. That's on find a grave. That's how you find out that it's there, military issues. Here are some documents for him. This is a little hard to read, but this is from his pension file. He filed a pension with the, with the Pension Bureau, and he talks about how he was injured in the fight of Poison Springs. He was shot in the hip. Sounds super painful. Um, and he talks about who the doctor was that took him and that could vouch for his injury. And they actually went and interviewed that person who then provided a statement. Um, something else that's interesting, some of these veterans got injured in the battles before they were mustered into the federal troops and the federal government tried to deny their pension claim because they weren't federally recognized. Luckily, they did get them. There is an adjutant's report where um, Amos Eder is part of a post for the Grand Army of the Republic in Lane, Kansas. And then here's his obituary in the newspaper. It says, the body of Amos Eder, the aged Negro soldier who died this week at the soldier's home, was buried at, at the home Thursday. The widow and children returned from Leavenworth Thursday night. 
Adair was 92 years old, had an interesting history. He was a slave, and when uh, the Emancipation Proclamation was issued, was past the half century mark. He enlisted in the Union Army as a member of the Kansas Regiment. He derived the name of Adair from the woman who owned him as a slave. It was right there in plain day. All right, last one. Anderson Riley, he was a part of Company E as well. He was born in the Cherokee Nation. I'm trying to figure out who his slaveholder was, but if you do any Freedman research, you know Riley is a surname that Freedmen have. So it's just a matter of trying to figure out who it is. Okay? Now, he was injured in Island Mound. He was injured in the first thing they did. Okay? He settled in Nebraska and later in Kansas after the war. He was very active in civil rights and as well as religious stuff. He was also part of the Grand Army of the Republic, and he's buried at Holton Cemetery in Holton, Kansas. And you see there is his headstone. More records for Mr. Anderson Riley. This is a handwritten affidavit from the surgeon of Company E validating his claim that he was injured in the Battle of Island Mound. All of this stuff, if you find a veteran, you can go to the National Archives, and I still question this. They hand you the actual stuff. Almost not, I almost feel not worthy <laughs> of touching these documents. But you walk into Archives 1 and they hand you these things. Uh, additionally for him, note it says, Henry Daniels and Anderson Riley recently visited the Indian Territory for the purpose of reclaiming their membership in the Cherokee tribe. Mr. Daniels was found and was warmly welcomed by his former mistress, who urged him to move to the Cherokee Nation. <laughs> then we have the debate at the colored church last Thursday evening was decided in favor of the Republican side of the question. Of course, the, honorary, uh, the Honorable Matt Martin, um, I don't know, I guess it's absolved, I don't know, eloquently pled for democracy and was assisted by Mr. Williams and Mr. Anderson. On the other side, Anderson Riley, Lewis Parks, and Mr. Brooks brought tears to the eyes of the audience in reciting the many virtues of the Republican Party. At the conclusion of this mass of eloquence and logic, the chairman got up and renounced that a great many hidden mysteries have been brought forward during this argument. <laughs> and then we've got him participating in, in a speech at the AME, as in the African Methodist Episcopal Church Festival. And he talked about why we colored people honor the name of General Grant. Of course he would say that because he was in the US colored troops. Then lastly, we have his obituary that was in the newspaper. You guys are probably like, they're pretty, yeah, they were printing these men's obituaries. He died, they talked about um, him being a part of the war, that he came to Holton, Kansas. He was a plasterer by trade. Then he was disabled by disease. His wife died some years ago. The fact that uh, they had children. One of the daughters was at Tuskegee at school when this happened. Two of them were in a, the, an orphan's home in Atchison. You see all this detail is there. He was a member of the AME Church. That connects back to this, so we know we have the same Anderson Riley. They talked about when the funeral was done and all of that. It was right there in the newspaper. And again, I told you, it's not just Kansas. It's not just Oklahoma, it's Missouri. You know the little bullseye that we have where all the states come together? If you've got anybody in those areas, the newspapers are incredible here. All right, that's it.